Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Firefish Software Future of Rec Crowdcast. I'm your host, Cameron McLennan from Firefish Software. And joining me today, I've got Francis West and Paul Chamberlain. So today we are going to be talking about uh, data and security and the legal aspects of running a recruitment agency and IT disasters uh, that can that can crop up and, uh, and arise while running the agencies. Um, the purpose of today really is to chat about how can you keep your agency safe. Before we jump into the chat, I just want the guys to tell uh, the viewers a little bit about themselves. So we'll start off with yourself, Francis. Uh, yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Francis West, running Chemical West Tech Solutions. And for my sins, I've been helping recruitment companies for the last 17 years, especially business owners and directors who are fed up to here with IT systems not working properly and ultimately resulting in very unhappy staff and loss of profits. Great. And Paul, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Chamberlain. I'm a partner in the employment and pensions team at Bratners. Uh, we're a Northwest-based uh, legal firm. We have about 70 partners and about 400 staff. And uh, uh, similarly, for my sins, I've been involved in recruitment advising agencies and others for the last 20 years or thereabouts. Great. Brilliant. So we might as well um, start off with uh, big, big disasters. So we'll uh, start off with you, Francis. What is the worst IT disaster you've ever heard a recruitment agency come across? Sure. Um, I've seen a few. But uh, as we're doing security today, I'll tell you about a security one that happened last year. A, uh, we were called in by a recruitment company to do a security audit. Mm -hmm. Because sadly, uh, just two months before, they were attacked by ransomware, so which meant that they came in one morning and um, sitting down at their machines looking to start working, and they have this lovely message displayed on their, all their um, computers to say, pay me so many bitcoins, otherwise you're not working today. Yeah. And, um, and sadly, it took their IT company or their support company, it took them five days to recover uh, back to a state where they could work again. So... If that wasn't bad enough, a month later, they walked in again in the morning, and um, they were they, the same same uh, message was there. Luckily, the good news is this time they were only down for two and a half days completely. So, so, so that was pretty bad. So that subsequently, they got us in to to do a security audit, and we found a lot of flaws. And subsequently, we've now become their provider, and uh, and they now fully patched up and secured. So touch wood, that would never ever happen to them again. But it can happen to easy anybody. You know, nowadays the, the figures show that you know somebody could be or, or could have been hacked two hundred and thirty one days ago before they even know it. It's a scary, uh, because everything's connected to the web now, um, people are becoming more and more vulnerable. Um, Paul, what about you in terms of any any funny, or not so funny, but um, any legal disasters you've encountered when it comes to data and security? Yeah, um, as, as lawyers, you'll appreciate we see disasters on a daily basis, hence the, the reason for clients wanting, wanting help and assistance. And the one that, that springs to mind, and we, you know, we, did, we do see quite a lot of this, but there, there was a particular case that we were involved in a few years ago where a recruitment consultant had decided to leave their, uh, their business and uh, join a competitor, um, and they thought that uh, unbeknown to their employer, um, it, it would be easy just to uh, copy, paste, and send to a private email address a whole list of clients and candidates uh, and the clear intention then of course was to then use that list mm -hmm. after they left now, our clients friend, computer consultants um, uh, spotted this but we've no evidence or the clients have no evidence at that stage that the individual um, had okay. actually contacted anybody on the list uh, but what the individual didn't know was that on that list and this is a great tactic by the way so if you want to take if you want to take some learnings from this example, uh, this is this is something to bear in mind. What the clients have done is they've actually populated the list um, with with some interesting clients and candidates who weren't in fact real clients and candidates. 
the candidates that were that have populated the list, or some of them, okay. were relatives uh, of the business owner, and indeed the contact details for some of the clients on the list were contact details of relatives. So, to cut a very long story short, eventually the recruitment consultant tripped themselves up because they said they hadn't used our list to contact anybody, but at the point at which the owner's relatives had been contacted, we then of course knew that the only way in which that could have happened is if the individual's details were on the list and they had a copy of the list. So at that point, they were absolutely bound to rights and uh, thankfully in that case, we didn't need to go to court. We got them to recognise that um, we had got the evidence that we needed uh, okay, so and that, what had happened there then was that the the person had the the person had taken the data to set up their own agency, and there was some ghost candidates and clients that were the owner's family. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. And at, at the point at which they they were contacted, we then of course had the evidence that was being denied that the individual had the list that they, Very interesting. they said they I like didn't that. have. It's good. So quite, quite, quite a good way to protect yourselves, um, or you prefer the list not to have not to have been copied and, and sent across in the first place, but invariably yeah. you can't yeah. avoid that. How, okay. how common um, are these types of events, would you say? Um, and this is kind of collectively to, to both of you guys. I mean, from your perspective, Francis, the, the security breaches and, and Paul, the legal ramifications, how, how common do these things happen? How often? Well, you go first. I mean, I, I, I see it a lot and that's why, you know, more and more of our clients now are using uh, monitoring software where we can snapshot the screens every second and we can also alert it. So if, if somebody opens up a certain screen or as soon as they start sending out more than, let's say the company policy is only to send out three CVs at a time. And as soon as people send out four, five, six, immediately we can, we can actually pause that email, park it and that one of the owners or manager directors can be alerted and that email will never go out. So that's one way. Uh, but it's, it's and again, it's again, educating people and, and telling them, listen, we're going to monitor absolutely everything you do. And if they do, then Paul steps in and slaps their hand very hard. <laughs> and for yourself, Paul, how often do you see this? That this type, I mean, is it, are these, these types of cases coming across your desk on a, on a daily basis? Well, it, it, it's it's certainly more frequently than it ever used to be. I'd be I hazard a guess and say that we'd probably get two or three inquiries along these lines every couple of weeks. Now they don't always materialise into court action, and of course, part of our job is to try and keep clients away from uh, from litigation if we can and resolve it in some other way. But we certainly get lots of inquiries from yeah. people who have this sort of thing go on. I mean, the point that's just been a very good one, of course, the without getting too involved in the legal of it, the, the legal position is very much around the employee's expectation of privacy. So if you're monitoring or you want to monitor what they're doing on your system, you're perfectly entitled to do that. There's nothing in law that says you can't, as long as the employees are all aware in advance that they have no expectation yeah. of privacy whilst they're using your systems. As long as you've got that agreed, everybody's aware of it, you can pretty much monitor what you need to monitor. Yeah. To I'd like business. to sort of open this up to the people that are viewing just now as well in terms of the comments box down the right hand side from the point of view that if you're running your own agency as well, there, you know, we're talking a lot about the legal ramifications and the, and the, the, the data side of things here as well. But if anybody thinks there's anything that they could implement from a, 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 a culture point of view inside the agency to stop these types of things from happening, then it'd be great, you know, to share these comments because I think quite often I'm in a fortunate position where I'm speaking to agency owners on a daily basis and these types of concerns that we're raising here are often ones that, that, that do get that do get raised. Um, it would be quite interesting to see if anyone thinks from a a culture point of view internally in an agency if there's any things they could put in place to, to, to stop that as well. Um, what, what are the actual legal ramifications of a data breach for, for an agency, uh, Paul? Well, um, the agency's got obligations clearly to people who provide it with information. So they've got obligations to candidates who provide invariably personal information about themselves to the agencies. They've got an obligation to keep that information yep. safe and confidential. 
Um, as regards comments, it's 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 broadly the same. Um, and indeed, there was a case very recently where um, the information commissioner was involved in a situation where exactly what I described earlier had happened, where information that had been collated by the employer had then been utilised, communicated, transmitted by a departing employee. And in those circumstances, the information commissioner took the view that there had been a breach of the Data Protection Act and the Data Protection Principles. And uh, if my memory serves me, they levied quite a substantial fine. So there's there's that there's that layer of obligation, which is almost a statutory or quasi-statutory obligation. Um, there are then obligations that you as the employer can impose on your employees by virtue of the contract that they enter into with you, the contract of employment. Um, and you know, we're great believers, as you would expect um, as employment lawyers in this space, great believers in ensuring that prevention is better than cure and putting something in the contract in the first instance, which makes it very clear to the employee what they can do and what they can't do as far as that information is concerned. That's crucial. We tend to find that people get themselves into difficulties, employer clients get themselves into difficulties where their contracts of employment are deficient, where they don't have enough information in there for the employee to be aware of what's expected of them from an information or a confidentiality perspective. So for us, um, a, a well-drafted contract is absolutely key to all of this. Yeah, sure. Uh um, in, in, terms of, in terms of legal ramifications, um, well, there's a whole host of remedies available to employers if the employee breaches their contract or threatens to breach their contract. Um, the most draconian sanction, of course, is to go off to a High Court judge and ask yeah. for what's called an injunction, which is an order that either compels yeah. someone to do something or more likely uh, prevents them from doing something. So if you are a, a, a recruitment business owner and you suspect that your employee or your former employee is about to utilise or disclose confidential information, it's a question of talking to your lawyers as quickly as possible getting the evidence together in a confidential way, because of course getting evidence together sometimes can alert the employee mm -hmm. to the fact that you're onto them, and that then changes their behavior. But if you can get the information together in a confidential yeah. way, in a secure way, then you're at liberty to go to a judge and ask for an injunction. Now, if, it, if it's not a case where an injunction's appropriate, uh, because there isn't a level of urgency or seriousness attached to it, then of course you still have um, a claim for damages. You can go to court and claim damages from the employee if, as a result of breaching their contract, you've suffered loss. And uh, it, it's not always the case that an injunction is either appropriate or necessary. A claim for damages will very often do the trick. So those are the those are broadly the remedies available to you from a legal perspective if you suffer. Okay, great. These types and of and debt so just to throw that over to you, Francis. Then, so if you you could have the the contract point is, is fantastic. So you've built, put a watertight contract together for your employees, but um, it happens to be that they're still uh, uh, decide that they're going to uh, help themselves to the data. What IT things can be put in place to, to prevent that type of thing from happening? Yeah, I, I you know what? I, for me, the simplest way, I, I did a video on it not, not so long ago, is to actually put in, and you know, he was uh, just, uh, which is just referring to the contracts and uh, we were my my best tip i think ever is to have a piece of paper that states exactly what's allowed and what's not allowed in the kitchen <laughs> where they make coffee so they can read it every single day so that they can't have any excuse that they didn't see it because sometimes if it's in a handbook or even some contract it's forgotten oh i don't remember i didn't see so that's from a just a you know common sense point of view, but but for me it, it's all about prevention is better than cure. So if people know that you've got systems in place, even if they're not even turned on all the time, then they're much more unlikely to to uh, to, to steal data. Number one. Number two. The other thing from a going back to the security side, because of course we're talking about data theft, but we also talk about potential breaches of you know, some person sitting in a dark room far, far away and coming into your machine. Yeah. 
Yeah. So for me, the, the big thing is, again, is, is, is talking about things like USB on the, on the PCs to turn that off. Because, you know, if you've got a, a, any but, you know, you, you know me, I'm a fan of iPhones. But if you have any phone but an iPhone, you are 400 times more likely to be infected to get a compromise because any smartphone is, is really realistically just a USB pen. Mm -hmm. So you take that, that lovely phone of yours, you know, smartphone home and, and, and you plug it into to some kid's laptop whose, whose friend has just been around, went on some dodgy website, downloaded something. So now the phone gets infected. So you then go back to the office and you, you put in a USB cable straight into the USB port and immediately you can be infected that way. So, you know, just to disable those things is a very simple way. Yeah. The other thing is, again, like I said earlier, is to use, I, I did put a post on just now, Active Track. Quite a few of our clients now use that product. And that snapshots the, the computer or the Mac, you know, every second, every five minutes, whatever you want. And at least that way, you know, every now and again, that if somebody opens something for what they shouldn't open, again, an alert can go off to either the, the manager or to the uh, to the owner, it doesn't matter who. But for me, it's, it's just alerting, built alerting and don't wait for, you know, people say, oh, you know what, we trust our staff. That's fantastic. I'm very happy for you. However, please put the systems in place to stop it happening from the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that's that would be my advice over and over again. But have several layers of security built into the system, both for from a staff point of view, but also from an external or internal attack point of view, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. There's, I think that's a valid point there as well. It's not necessarily the, the employees that are looking to yeah. uh, take the data. It could be an external attack as well coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, um, so on the hacking side of things, Paul, um, is there what legal recourse is there, there for, for hacking? Is there anything that an agency could do if they were, that they were hacked? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in those circumstances, Cameron, I suspect you'd be looking to some assistance from the current authorities, so you'd want to get the police involved. Um, I don't have much experience in that area, but just, um, you know, a little bit of um, a, a, a little bit of evidence from stories that I've heard, very often the police are not particularly interested, or if they're interested, they don't really understand the nature of the offence that's been committed. Yeah. Um, I think they're getting better uh, than they ever have been in relation to they're much they're much more aware now of the types of issues that that, that businesses face um, in this digital age and, and in this sort of information technology age. Um, but aside from that, unless you know who is responsible for the hacking, um, it's very yeah. difficult to take any civil action against them. You know, if you, if you want to bring a civil claim, you need to know who you who you've got to sue, and invariably these people are organised criminal gangs. Um, it's difficult to identify who they are, even to work out where they are. They may not be in the jurisdiction, they may be outside the jurisdiction, that makes life even more difficult. So it's a really tricky one from a legal perspective. And um, I think actually the points that have been made so far are, are better points around the practicalities of preventing it from happening in the first place. Um, I mean, I might just perhaps add to that that it's not just it's not just the the actual practicalities, the physical practicalities, which can try and prevent this. Again, I go back to the point I made earlier about having contracts of employment in mm -hmm. place that make it abundantly clear. Um, and I like the suggestion that perhaps there's something posted in the uh, in the kitchen area or in the in the social area at, at people's places of work, so that they're aware of it. Um, you, you, you also need to think very carefully, and we've not touched yeah. on this, but I wanted just to mention it. It, it. Certainly in recruitment, there's a lot of use, as everybody mm -hmm. knows, of social media. So uh, LinkedIn in particular is, is one area that, that has, that has yeah. caught in a lot of attention recently. And we were, we were involved, if I, could, if I can mention this, we were involved in okay. a case involving LinkedIn um, a, a few years okay. ago. Um, and it might, it might be useful to make the point here around documentation. Had it not been in this case for the client's very clear and contractual social media policy, 
then I doubt very much that we would have got the help from the court that we eventually were able to secure. I mean, again, to cut a long story short, there was an individual who had set up a LinkedIn account, had used it whilst they were in employment, and they'd signed a social media policy to say that when they left, they would hand over the account details mm -hmm. and the password to their employer. Uh, they decided to leave, they refused to hand over the, uh, the account details, um, and they were quite resistant to the requests that we made on our client's behalf for them to hand those over. In the end, because of the value of the, of the, of the potential loss to the business uh, a, a, attached to this LinkedIn account, uh, we went off to court and we asked a judge to grant us an injunction, and the judge did. The judge forced the individual to hand over the account access details, and the client then went into the account and cleansed it, and then to call the business contacts out and handed it back with just their, their social and personal contacts intact. And that was a great example of where the courts, I think, are now moving with the times, and they're recognising that social media platforms, like LinkedIn in particular in this sector, um, can be used to the employer's detriment, and they are they are moving the law, they're yeah. developing the law in that way to yeah. give the employer Brilliant. <clears throat> um, Francis, see from your, your side of things as well, um, in terms of just day-to-day -day tips for people's security, I mean, we were speaking on the phone the other day, and you mentioned something about uh, Google and the way that Chrome likes to, to store passwords, that type of thing. Have you any tips for people just day-to-day -to, -day to make things a little bit more secure? Yeah, definitely. The... You know the biggest challenge with with uh, when you go as a, as a user nowadays, there, there's so many places where you've got to log on and you've got to put in a username and a password. And I don't know about you, Cameron, but half the time I can't remember my username, never mind my password. I can't remember what I had for and, breakfast this morning, Francis. Never mind well, your names and passwords. No, uh, you should stick to your partner. <laughs> okay, up again. The, uh, so, and the biggest problem that we have now is, of course, so so all these browsers are, are, are giving you the option to save the passwords. Yeah. Which is a small disaster because unless you <clears throat> log in properly, say, into Google Chrome and you, they've got a new feature where you've got a, like a secure password manager, most people don't do that. So if you just click save password, it stores it in a, in a basically in a, in a clear text file. So again, if you remember, if you went to onto some dodgy website and somebody needs to somebody by by mistake, you click on a link and you download some dodgy software, which is which which then easily goes on your PC or Mac. They can interrogate this file, yep. and very easily, and they can see every single link you've been to, every password and every username you've ever saved on that computer, and that's why people get hacked so easily. So. And I recommend people use password managers uh, for two reasons. One, obviously, to be safe, because at least with the password manager, you have a master password that only you know. Yep. And uh, and I've even recommended this to to recruitment companies because, uh, which we, I'll, I'll come back. So my second reason is is because of saving time, because every time you've got to go and find a, a username and a password, and a lot of people store it in in a Word document. Of course, that's not secure either. And it's easily just easy to steal. So, so if you if you use a product such as RoboForm, R O B O F O R M, I'll send a link in a minute. Mm -hmm. I've been using it for six years. It uses military style encryption. It even uses fingerprint technology on my iPhone. So unless I lose both my thumbs, I can't <laughs> lose my data. And what it does every single time I change a screen or a, 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 you know a tab, it pops up again if I go to another site. And for me, that's the most securest way of storing any any um, locations of websites or applications you use, including passwords. And it saves a lot of time. And here's my tip of the day, because, again, if you think about, say, 20, 30, 50 staff, whatever you have, if you have one uh, RoboForm account, which is like 15 quid a year, mm -hmm. and you have a master password, imagine you all use it in the business, and then Johnny decides to leave the business. All you have to do is to change one master password and immediately, you know, the, the, the rest of the business that's staying there gets the new password and at least that person can't get back in. So it's a very quick way of controlling who's got access to what and a secure way. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Now, a lot of the things we've been talking about today um, are very, very serious um, you know, if you're thinking about starting up an agency, we're raising a lot of points here that, that people really, really want to, to consider. Um, 
is there any bits of advice that each of you would give to someone who dis if they were deciding to start an agency tomorrow um, to prevent this type of thing happening to them? You want to go first, Paul? Yeah, by all means. Um, it, well, I think my my mantra throughout this afternoon's presentation has been ensuring that employees uh -huh. are aware uh, of the approach that you take and the seriousness that you attach yeah. to data security. Um, I think you've only yourselves to blame if you're setting up a recruitment business and you don't take that seriously. At the end of the day, if you think about it, the recruitment business is only as good as the information mm -hmm. it has, both on clients and candidates. So that's it's all very, very valuable information. And you know, it's a bit like saying, well, put your jewellery into the safe, yeah. but don't close the door. Um, you've only done a, you've only done a partial job. If all of your information is on the system, but you don't regulate or monitor or prevent unauthorized access or usage um, to or, or, or of that information. So I think very early on um, in any new business, people who you work with have got to be fully aware of the seriousness and the yeah. importance that you attach to these things. And you, also, you need to have some robust policies in place. Now, I, I, I don't for one second suggest that you go overboard with, you know, a, a war and peace handbook um, that has every possible policy under the sun that you might want. But you do need to prioritise very early on what's important to your new business. You could, you could spend a good 12, 18 months setting up that business yeah. and getting it into a good shape, only to find that a little employee leaves and takes the whole thing away with them. And you will rue that day if you haven't got in place appropriate policies and procedures. So be be critical um, and self-analyzing about the types of policies and procedures that you need. But please do put the security of your information and your data yeah. at the top of that list and look after it because it you know it it it, it is your uh, yeah. it is your wage package. And for yourself, yeah. Francis. Yeah, I, you know what? I couldn't agree more with Paul because I think number one, you need to two things. You need to tell people, especially as the business grow, because if you want two, three people, you know, you surround yourself with people like I said earlier that you really trust, and all is fine until one day. So, but from day one, you know, engage with somebody like Paul so that you have the right um, documentation in place. So as people start, this is what I expect. This is how we deal with data. Number one. Number two. And then from an IT side is please, please, please do not use free antivirus software. Pay for it. Get the best you can. You know, my one of my recommendations, WebRoot, you know, for like 30 pounds a month or a year, sorry, a year, you can have five machines protected. But, you know, it, it, it's the simplest thing that's going to save you the most. Uh, you know, your data, if you're going to save your data, especially Word, Excel files, save it into a place that does version control. Mm -hmm. So in other words, any... At any time any of your staff touches any file, at least there's a log of it. Um, and then, you know, simple other things such as, again, from a maintenance point of view, you know, make sure that all your machines are maintained. You know what I mean by maintained, that all the software is updated and yeah. your, your latest Adobe and the latest this and the Windows updates are done not monthly, not weekly, almost daily now. There's a lot of ways to automate it. And then... Um, you know, when you get bigger, you know, like I said, that, that other link I sent on, on Active Track, you can have three users for free. Yeah. So you put the stuff on random machines, not all the machines, just on random machines. You, you, you're going to laugh now, but I even put it on my son's laptop and my daughter's machine. Because every time my son, after 8 p.m., goes in the, on his uh, football league for more than 15 minutes, I get an alert and I go, Emil, why are you on? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you on the football again? You should be doing your... So my point, I'm using it for a different method, but it's brilliant. Yeah. But my point is, again, so if you start with a kind of software, you know, in place, then at least people know it's there and, and they'll respect your data a lot more. And, and, and again, you know, whether it's from a legal perspective or from a technology perspective, prevention is better than cure. Otherwise, you fight fires when you come in afterwards. Yeah, brilliant. In terms of... Yeah. Cameron, Cameron, could I just jump into that point just to just to reiterate that because I think you know one of the things that frustrates us as lawyers very often is when clients come to us and um, 
they're not able to demonstrate how their information or data has been manipulated or utilized. And everything that Francis has just said would be manna from heaven for us as lawyers if that level of um, information about the way in which documents have been used, when they've been opened, when they've been amended, when they've been mm -hmm. saved, when they've been transmitted, that type of audit trail for us as lawyers, if we find ourselves in this situation, is 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 really very, very important and worth its weight in gold. We spend so much time trying to find evidence that employees have done something wrong. Um, and if the type of audit information that Francis has, has alluded to as being available is available to us, we can we can make a lot of that. We can make a lot of use of it and we can uh, we can hopefully get you from A to B in a much quicker and much more Good. effective way. In terms of the um Normally, we I would round up these by, by talking about like the, the the future of recruitment. What do people think the future of recruitment looks like? Um, Paul, for yourself, I mean, with the experience that you've got in the sector, what do you think that the, the future looks like for recruitment industry? Yeah, well, I'm I'm going to go Cameron completely off piece with this. It's nothing to do with what we've been spending the last twenty five minutes or so talking about. Um, I think we are um, eventually moving back to a position where all temps are going to be engaged on a PAYE basis. Um, if you look at what's happened over the last few years, you look at the way the revenue have attacked, um, first mm -hmm. of all, travel and subsistence schemes, um, false self-employment. They've got firmly, of course, within their sites now, changes to yeah. the IR35 regime. Uh, and for those of uh, those of your clients and people listening to this uh, to this cast are aware, as from April, um, there's going to be a change if you mm -hmm. supply people into the public sector. Um, I, and I think the, if you look at a trend, the trend is to close down these uh, what some people would regard as tax efficient ways of supplying services, but others would regard as as tax. Um, tax avoidance ways of providing services, I think we're going to end up in a position in the not too distant future where limited company contractors don't exist anymore um, and where we are back to the position it used to be 20 years ago when I first started in the sector where virtually every temp was directly engaged by the agency on a PAY basis. It'd be interesting to see what happens with that. The regulations are going to be yeah, yeah, interesting to yeah. say the least. Um, what about yourself, Francis? What do you think um, the future of recruitment yeah. looks like? Well, I'm, I'm going to answer it from a, from a technology point of view. Okay. And that is that, uh, you, you know, we started off many years ago with, with PCs and then we went a full circle. We went to dumb terminals and, main, you, know, uh, you know, everything sitting in the cloud. And then we came back down again, people using PCs again. And it's going a full circle again because of video. For me, absolutely, video is so important. We're doing it now. Um, I show people how to send video emails, and you know the the way of communicating has completely changed. Uh, which again, from a security point of view, makes it harder. So people use Snapchat and, and and WhatsApp and all these things, and that that's the new form of communication when it comes to recruitment. And and of course, with that comes all the security risks, all the stuff that we already covered. But for me, any recruitment business has, has four pillars. The first one is the CRM, you know, which is like Firefish and it's cloud-based. The second one is that they must have, you know, a, a currency system, not Sage, either Zero or QuickBooks. And then, uh, you know, a file system, which, you know, a file system that's easily monitored. And um, what have I missed out? And, and of course, Office 365, which is your email and, uh, and also Skype for Business. Because I've seen so many times now where people use Skype for business, not even for video, but for chat. Yeah, yeah. Because once you have somebody connected on Skype for business, talking to them, I mean, there's so many studies that have been done now that when you start chatting with people, they respond, you know, instead of sending them an email. I think email is going to die. You know, yeah, I think email email is just is a, is a necessary evil and potentially so is the phone. I think people that invented phones and email should be shot. But... <laughs> You know, although I put the systems in, I, I think we need to move away from communicating with email and and um, 
you know, and, and phones and rather communicate with people. I met somebody even last week and, and she's in a, in a, uh, uh, she's a, a digital marketing lady and, and she works around the world in a lot of recruitment companies. She doesn't answer her phone. Yeah. So if somebody wants to talk to me, either send me a chat message and, and I mean, she's older than me. <laughs> I'm like, good for you. You know, this is different, but this is where we're going yeah. because all the new people joining our recruitment companies, they all, communicate in different ways so you've got to attract them in that way and also coming back to video that's why i said it's so easy now with a, with a good quality smartphone to post videos on on, on your youtube channel and because I, I, that's one thing i like about firefish because you guys do so much on social media and and that's what people you know from a staffing point of view enjoy and people that that you're going to be selling to also enjoy because they like the instant you know, feedback. Yeah. I, and you don't get that from emails and phones. No, I think that's the, the direction it's going in from the agency side as well. I think that candidates and clients expect to be able to find the answers to questions they have mm. before they choose to engage with another human in a conversation nowadays. If yeah. you don't have the information ready for them online um, and it's easy digestible for them and they can't find what they want, they'll go somewhere else until they find the answer to the right question and they'll engage with those people. So I think we're going to see an evolution of uh, agencies are going to start having better websites, better social profiles, yeah. um, and that's going to continue to, to evolve over time. Um, chaps, I uh, just want to take an opportunity to uh, thank you both very much for taking time out of your of your days today to, to join us on the Firefish Crowdcast. It's, it's very much appreciated. Um, thanks. Pleasure. You're welcome. Paul, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Francis, thanks again. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, sign us off. Thanks very much, everyone, for, uh, for tuning in today. Uh, it's really appreciated, and we'll see you soon on the next Firefish Software Future of Rec Crowdcast. Thanks very much. Right. Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.